No. And yet you well, visit him every week in prison. He's what do you, in jail. <laughs> what do you chat about? Pardon? What do you chat about when you visit Charlie? Um, trees, the bugs getting gone, no more butterflies, could, could dirty you water. Could you stand up, TJ, yeah. just for a second? I just want to show people your shirt right there. Pull your jacket back. This is not a follower of Manson, although he does wear a shirt that is emblazoned with uh, Charlie's image. These are uh, on These sale everywhere. Somebody gave oh, for me sale everywhere. Uh, could you, could you, Somebody gave this to me. Could you stand, Anson, 13? Could you show us your leggings? Can you see the leggings? These are, uh, we said, uh, they are, we are told are available at a store near you. Did you get a shot? Did it's, you see them? It's Hate Street in San Francisco. Oh, okay. We'll be sure to go and... Uh, Amoeba go. clothing. Uh, I, and I know you're not a follower, but what does the 13 signify in your name? Well, when Charlie was on death row, he was in cell 13. And when he got released in 1972, he just gave me the name Ansem 13. So, there so you go. So, you're, you're bearing the name that Charlie bestowed on you? Yeah. Just like your mom probably called you, uh, whatever she called you. You know, it's just like a name of affection, more or less. Right but you're not a follower. No, I'm not a follower. I follow myself. He keeps doing that. <laughs> I don't need any direction in my follower. life. Uh, John, why do you wear the mask? I'm curious. I'm uh, in front of a bunch of people and a, a whole bunch of other people behind that camera who've judged something to be evil. And at the moment, because of my family and associations, uh, I don't want to be one of the Christians thrown to the lions, at least, you know, not economically or socially, etc. Do I've you, had that experience. You, by, are you a working man? Do you yes, I'm a working person. I'm a uh, working person. On the uh, on the rare chance that you folks at home or here in our studio don't recall these crimes, well, for those of you who were born well after 1969, what I'd like to do now is to travel back in time. I'd like to travel back 22 years, back to when the words "helter skelter" were first branded on the national consciousness. It was 1969. Hippies were free, loving, dropping acid, preaching peace, and living communally in extended families. The one family that didn't quite fit in with the rest was Manson's tribe. Crazed by drugs and Manson's ravings, they spent their time stealing cars and committing robbery. Then under Charlie's spell, they turned to homicide. It was here at Spawn Ranch that the bloody plan was born. Its creator told his followers to massacre. The intent? To start a race war hitting black against white. His followers, mostly young, fairly educated women from middle-class families, were so enthralled with Manson, they obeyed his every command. He's our, our father. He's uh, our leader. He's, he's our, our love. He's uh, okay. our teacher. He's everything. In fact... Charlie is Jesus Christ. Susan Atkins, Leslie Van Houten, Patricia Quinwinkle, Linda Casabia, and Tex Watson. All obeyed the maniac's every word. They went on a killing spree that began with a musician, Gary Henman. Then they worked their way into the home of Sharon Tate. Here they brutally murdered five people, including Sharon Tate's unborn child. The bodies of Stephen Parent, Jay Sebring, Wojtek Prokowski, the coffee heiress, Abigail Folger, and Sharon Tate, all lay in pools of blood. On the walls of the house, the words pig spelled out in the victim's blood. The next night, on the other side of town, the murderous band slaughtered Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. Here, too, they left their mark in blood, the words helter skelter and pigs. They left the murder scenes with neither remorse nor guilt. At the time, it was supposed to help people. It was supposed to start a revolution that would uh, clean the souls of everyone. The family would later get busted at Spawn Ranch when the police swooped in to disband what they thought was just an auto theft ring. At unveil, the Manson clan moved to Barker Ranch. Soon after, they were busted again. By December 1969, Manson and his homicidal followers were all behind bars. Linda Kasabian was granted immunity if she testified about the murders. She did. In 1971, Charles Manson, along with Susan Atkins, Patricia Crinwickle, Leslie Van Houten, and Tex Watson, were convicted for the murders that had left the nation stunned. Here's Tex Watson at a parole hearing in 1984. Uh, there's no question. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make that uh, uh, even though I was the leader at the time, I was also very much a follower. This is Leslie Van Houten in an interview from prison. 
In my opinion, the courtroom was just a follow-up of the crimes. You know, Charlie was conducting the courtroom. Uh, what do you mean? Well, he was telling us what to say, you know, uh, when to stand up, you know, when to carve the X, when to shave our heads. Every day it was like a new agenda on what we should do for the day. And here's Charlie, straight from San Quentin. These kids come around me. Yeah. They say, you're God. You have the voice of God. And I say, uh, there's a whole penitentiary of guys like me. You know, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm just a messenger. I'm a witness. That's all. I'm just a, a poop butt that dropped out of the penitentiary. And they seen something in me I didn't see in me. What they see? They seen a nice guy. And I'm not a nice guy. I agree. But they seen that. So I said, well, as long as they seen the nice guy, I'll reflect the nice guy. I'll be the nice guy to them. 22 years, but in some ways that crime seems like it happened just yesterday. Your question, sir? Yes, I refer my question to the friends of Charlie. You refer to uh, Charlie Manson as being uh, very innocent and non-capable of such crimes, but when I look at the, the pictures that you wear proudly on your shirt and pants, the, the glare and the image that I'm left with is uh, Satan-like and very barbaric. Um, how, That's your judgment. Uh, that is his look at you telling him that he is that. He will look at you because that is what you are projecting from your heart. That's no, that why doesn't make sense. He I, I project my own what, image. That's where the look originated. That's where that picture came from. The cover of Life magazine in December 69. I wore this shirt because I didn't have any more shirts and somebody had given it me to wear. It. But I got here and there's no... Okay, uh, okay. Uh, there's no yes, laundry sir. here in New York. Where's the laundry? In the eye of the beholder, sir. Yes, my question is to the uh, fellow at the end. Uh, why, why, John, yeah, why do you believe that uh, Charles Manson is, Manson is innocent? Well, I knew the man and I followed the... Uh, trials and the uh, evidences that were given during the trials and I you know spoken to him personally I know the other people that were involved and uh, like I say uh, he, he he said to me that he didn't send anybody to do anything and uh, the evidence in the court was just about that except for the one exception of the lady who was given immunity yeah, also joining us, I, I might as well bring everyone into the mix here. First, there's Deborah Fraser. Deborah is the attorney for Susan Atkins. Susan Atkins, of course, one of the killers in the, uh, in the mass crime, uh, at least at Sharon Tate's house. Uh, Susan Atkins was one of the knife wielders and uh, I, I believe is the one who stuck the knife and killed the unborn child, at least no. that's the way I've been told the story. I have had a lot of people ask me about that. Sharon Tate's baby was never taken out of her body, and in order to, to talk to people about that, I had contacted Stephen Kay, who is the district attorney that took over the case from Vincent Bugliosi, and went up to Los Angeles in the criminal courts building and took a look at the autopsy pictures. And although the t pictures are ra rather horrible to look at, Sharon's, body, Sharon's baby was intact. Susan never took that child out, and apparently... But the baby was stabbed, though. No. no, not at all. No, she has one stab wound to the side, near, more near her pelvis area. And then there, there were 16 stab wounds to her chest, and then there was a cut to the side of her face. And apparently she was also hung and was asphyxiated. Oh, oh okay. I'm glad you straightened that out for us. Uh, <clears throat> Bill Nelson, the author of the new book, Tex Watson, The Man, The Madness, The Manipulation, also joins us. You know, before we get uh, more deeply into... Uh, all this stuff to TJ and to John I, I really would like to know what it was like on Spawn Ranch let's put aside the question of guilt or innocence and I know that that's part of your agenda today what was it like how many people lived on Spawn Ranch TJ a lot of people most uh, you know it was like a, a place to be that you were accepted and welcomed you know you were it was a nice place uh, entertaining uh, you, you entertained yourself because you had to work all the time you know and, uh, and how many people were there at various times? I and mean, what would it average? Uh, 30, 40 people. Was there's, it there's lots of other people living there, too. You know, there was the bikers were living over on one side, and a 